We want to get it right to some breaking news tonight. A standoff underway after two people were shot in far west of Bear County. It's happening at a home in the Alamo Ranch area. The night team's Tiffany Huertas is live near Lexi Petal and Alamo Parkway. And Tiffany, what are you learning tonight? Yeah, so we arrived here around 7.30 p.m. And it's a very active scene, but we were close to the home that is being investigated, but we were pushed back. Bear County Sheriff deputies said it was not safe where we were. But let's take a look at this video. Deputies have surrounded the home located in the summit at Alamo Ranch neighborhood. At one point, we heard deputies trying to communicate with someone over speaker. They also kept flashing a spotlight at the second floor windows of the home. BCSO says two people were shot and were taken to a local hospital. Their conditions are unknown at this time. I spoke to neighbors in the area who did not want to go on camera, but say this is a quiet community. Many are concerned with this situation. Now, this is an active scene. Deputies are blocking the streets in this area, and we will bring you the latest as soon as we have more information. Back to you. Thank you, Tiffany. It's being called a critical moment in this pandemic. More testing, more education, and a stronger emphasis on enforcement of safety protocols. With cases rising, city officials are expanding free testing to COVID-19 hotspots in the city. The city added five walk-up testing locations with two on the south side, two on the west side, and another northwest of downtown. While no new deaths were reported, our seven-day average remains above the 200 mark tonight. It did drop by a single digit today, but the rolling average has been on an upward trend since last week. Our local hospitals seeing a slight decrease tonight. 223 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital. It's only two fewer than last night. 80 are now in the intensive care unit. 38 people are on ventilators. Expanded testing hopes to limit the spread and keep those rates from rising. Here's a closer look at the locations made available in areas described to be hot spots. The testing site at the Edgewood Square Shopping Center on General McMullen will be open through November 5th. The South Park Plaza testing site and West Avenue location are open. Mayor Nuremberg says the Lady of the Lake University location set to open tomorrow and the Daughters of Charity location will open on November 11th. There's a complete list of sites on the city's website. We have a link on ksat.com. Mayor Ron Nuremberg said tonight he will not approve any non-exempt outdoor gatherings of more than 10 people. If you want to report a violation of safety protocols, the mayor encouraging you to call 210-207-SAPD. Well, developing tonight, a house fire raising suspicion for investigators. Flames broke out at a Southside home on the 700 block of Whitman Avenue. Firefighters say the home was divided into two sections with flames starting at a front corner of the home. Everyone was able to get out without any serious injuries. Arson investigators did speak with some people on scene and are now working to confirm the details they gathered as part of their fire investigation. There's still little known about the woman who died in a two alarm fire this morning. The Bear County Medical Examiner is still working to confirm her identity. The neighbors we spoke with say they didn't know the 63 year old woman at the Star Club Apartments on Starcrest Drive, but we're sorry to hear the news. I mean, we thought it was, we didn't know what it was. There was so many fire trucks, so many ambulances, and so much commotion. Um, at the time we were over there, they didn't mention anybody at uh, passed, so to hear somebody did is really, really upsetting. One dog and the 63 year old woman were found dead once crews put the fire out. Three other apartments had smoke and water damage, and those residents were put in touch with the Red Cross. The cause of the fire is under investigation. A San Antonio family demanding change after their loved one was killed while crossing the street. Juan Martinez was hit by a car at North Zarzamora and Culebra Road last week. His family says he was trying to get to the bus stop. The night team Stephen Cavazos with why they believe his death should have never happened. It's not easy. There's so many memories. Those memories are what Yolanda Betancourt and her family are now holding on to. Her brother, Juan Martinez, was killed after he was hit by a car while crossing the street at North Sazamora and Culebra last Wednesday. Tonight, family and friends gathered at the same spot to remember his life. Betancourt says her brother's only way of transportation was a bus, and he crossed Culebra trying to get to the closest pickup spot, which sits near the busy intersection. She says he died trying to get home. Everyone's just heartbroken. 
San Antonio police say Martinez wasn't using a crosswalk at the time he was killed, but Betancourt believes the road has become a death trap and crosswalks aren't helping. Martinez would have been 52 today. Instead of celebrating his birthday, his family and friends are now calling for action. How many more Juan Martinez's have to pass away before there is a change? She says there needs to be slower speed limits and speed bumps along Culebra, and the bus stop should be relocated. District 1 Councilman Roberto Trevino says this isn't the first time his office has heard these concerns. He says Culebra has been a problem spot for years. It's one of those streets in our city that is that is very wide and takes a long time for pedestrians to cross. Trevino says there are several projects in the works to help improve infrastructure in the area, from sidewalks to more lighting. He believes changes to the area would be life-saving. Every one of these thefts are preventable. Uh, through a combination of, of, of efforts. Bettencourt says she wants her brother's death to serve as a message for change the community desperately needs. This is the reason why we're here. Stephen Cavazos, KSAT, 12 News. VIA tells us they are coordinating with the city to design and construct improvements to the area. Those include new sidewalks and curb ramps where gaps exist to create safer crossing for pedestrians. The project is still in design, but VIA says there currently are no plans to relocate bus stops. The polls are closed and one more day of early voting remains. So far, more than 608,000 votes have been cast in Bear County. That number expected to rise after tonight's totals. We expect them any time now. The polls will be open from 8 a.m. until 10 p.m. tomorrow. And in Texas, more than 8.5 million voters have visited the polls so far. The U.S. Elections Project also reporting more than 81 million votes have been cast across the nation. Well, city leaders today voting to bar pet stores from selling purebred dogs from breeders. The ordinance passed today restricts pet owners to only selling cats or dogs they acquired from city or county shelters, animal control agencies, or animal rescue groups. The measure acknowledges concern over so-called puppy mills, a term animal rights activists use to describe large commercial breeding operations, especially those with poor conditions. Some pet store owners argue while there may be bad breeders, there are good ones as well. The new pet store restrictions will take effect at the new year. A possible case of excessive force captured on camera. A man tackled by sheriff's deputies after he asked them to identify themselves during a traffic stop. It happened earlier this month in Maverick County, just outside of Eagle Pass. The night team's Dylan Collier examined the footage and spoke with many of the people involved. They say deputies went out of their way to escalate the situation. It's tonight's Defenders report. Well across the Maverick County line in this neighborhood along Casales Road, an October 14th traffic stop erupted into a confrontation between sheriff's deputies and residents that weeks later <gasps> is still being sorted out. They went from zero to 100 in two seconds, and that's not right. Norma Jimenez, who has a background in law enforcement, got a call that night that her daughter's boyfriend, Ernesto Flores, was in the custody of Maverick County Sheriff's deputies and facing possible arrest after recording video of them outside his home. The deputies minutes earlier had pulled over Flores' sister and her boyfriend for possible traffic violations. As Flores stood near the front of a patrol vehicle, asking for the deputies' names, one of them charged Flores, taking him to the ground as a second deputy joined the fray. They were both on top of me, had my arm like this. Flores said he was pepper sprayed, with the droplets missing his eyes by inches. Video recorded by a neighbor and posted on Facebook shows Flores in handcuffs. He says he was released a few minutes later. Pictures taken after the incident show noticeable injuries to his back. An ordeal witnesses say started because deputies didn't like being recorded. Just an automatic reaction and they just took him down and I think it was very wrong. So what about another angle from the vantage point of deputies? We're told two of them were wearing body cameras, but that the recording stopped around the time they moved in on Flores. Maverick County Sheriff Tom Schmerber did not respond to phone calls, emails, and even in-person requests seeking comment for this story. A sheriff's records person falsely claimed to the defenders this month that they didn't have to release footage of the incident to us. 
Flores and Jimenez were allowed to view what video does exist October 19th and says it doesn't change their opinion that deputies acted out of line. It was excessive. They just went straight at him. For the defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. If Flora says he plans to pursue a formal excessive force complaint against those two deputies, despite that large scale law enforcement response, witnesses say no one was arrested that night and that the driver of the stopped vehicle was given a simple traffic citation. We continue to follow that breaking news situation in far west Fair County, but first let's check in with Katie. <laughs> it's a nice cool 54 degrees out there. Morning low of 42 up to 68 this afternoon. We'll see very similar temperatures tomorrow, but we'll lose the gusty winds that we had in place today. So nearly a uh, picture perfect Friday coming up. But what about trick or treating on a Saturday evening? We'll talk about that forecast coming up in a few minutes. Steve. Thank you, Katie. We're continuing to follow that breaking situation in far west of Bear County. Two people shot at a home surrounded by Bear County deputies. The sheriff expected to speak in a few mo moments. Our crew on the scene ready to bring you any new developments as they become available. Plus, a local teacher faced with her own battle with breast cancer at the age of 29. Her message and the latest on her journey coming up next on the Night Beat. forget about your loved one. Dia de los Muertos commemorates those who have passed away and some celebrate by making altars. Tomorrow on GMSA we'll show you how to make a mini altar to celebrate your loved one. It was an unexpected diagnosis, especially at the young age of 29. Catherine Perry had one of the most aggressive forms of breast cancer, a journey she had to do alone due to the pandemic. But the diagnosis didn't keep her from doing what she loves most, teaching. March 1st is a day Catherine Perry will never forget. It's the day she got the call that she had triple negative breast cancer. She remembers feeling a range of emotions. Shocked and terrified and angry. Last October, she felt a lump in one of her breasts. And I thought, surely this cannot be cancer. Like I was just at the doctor in August, there's no way. But the lump just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Even her doctors didn't think it was cancer, but it was, and it was aggressive. If I hadn't gone in, um, I don't know that I would like be here because that's how fast it was growing. Perry remembers telling her eighth grade students at Jackson Middle School about the cancer. I came in on Wednesday and I told them and they cried, all of them. The love and support from her school, family, and friends helped her get through five months of chemotherapy. Virtual learning allowed her to keep teaching even during her treatments. I didn't want my identity to be Cat Perry cancer patients. Like it was so important to me to still hold on to something. And so teaching was a way for me to do that. She had a mastectomy in mid-August, and on August 31st, she was declared cancer-free. Very, very grateful for my past self that I went in and uh, got it taken care of. Um, it's still scary, like, even now knowing that it's gone, but triple negative has the highest rate of recurrence. She has a message for everyone. Check yourself, whether you're young or old. It's not just your health, but it, it could be your life that's on the line. Now, Perry says she's also grateful for her medical team at the Start Center for Cancer Care. We asked her what she's looking forward to once the pandemic is over. She said having a big party to celebrate that she no longer has cancer. Well, we're celebrating. Yes, indeed. Our KSAD web team has also put together resources surrounding Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Earlier this month, we spoke to Dr. Kate Lathrop with the UT Health San, with UT Health San Antonio and the Mays Cancer Center as part of our KSAD Q&A. Dr. Lathrop spoke with us about the importance of getting checkups amid this pandemic. You can watch it all online right now on KSAT.com. 
Well, turning now to our weather, let's take a live look outside with live cam. It was such a nice day out there in the evening, shaping up to be a pretty good one, too. I'm just glad the wind yes. died down for a little bit. <laughs> yes, and the wind gusts that were quite high this afternoon, especially off west of 35 in the Hill Country and Edwards Plateau. I mean, they've just fell off the board this evening, and that's some good news because the wind was kind of a nuisance today. Otherwise, a beautiful day and taking the wind out of the picture tomorrow, shaping up to be a picture perfect Friday. Nice and cool for trick or treating Saturday evening, and really this nice fall like weather is going to continue through Election Day early next week. A few little minor changes here or there, but overall very nice. 54 now at the airport dew point in the low 40s. Our winds out of the north northwest just five miles per hour and not reporting a gust, not reporting any gusts across South Texas. So again, winds have really relaxed this evening. Our sustained winds generally are about five to 10 miles per hour, uh, but pretty light and they're going to stay that way overnight. Right now our temperatures low to mid 40s up in the hill country 51 in Pleasanton. We've got a few upper 50s and low 60s on the board but overall cool and dry dew points in the 30s and 40s. That is uh, feeling nice and dry out there, and that's what's making it feel so fall like. So with the winds relaxing, with the dry air in place and clear skies, our temperatures will bottom out low 40s for most of us overnight. A few spots in the hill country will certainly drop into the mid to upper 30s. So here's where we'll start off tomorrow morning. Jackets or light sweater weather for sure. But just like today, we're going to warm up very nicely tomorrow afternoon. So a day to dress in layers tomorrow. 40s in the morning, but 70s for most of us Friday afternoon under completely sunny skies. Going to be a beautiful day tomorrow, uh, and it's shaping up to be a great evening for our football games tomorrow. Again, with that wind being light, just east northeast at five miles per hour. No issues with wind for games tomorrow evening by about seven o'clock. Temperatures in the low 60s falling into the mid to upper 50s by halftime. So you'll want a light jacket with you if you're heading out to any games tomorrow evening. Sunset tomorrow 649 sunset on Saturday around the same time. But you know what's coming this weekend? Daylight saving time is ending 2 a.m. on Sunday morning. So that means our sunrise and sunset times are going to be earlier. So we'll go from a sunset around 648 on Halloween to a sunset around 547 by Sunday evening. So that is on the way this weekend. But this is the one where we get the extra hour of sleep. So uh, not all bad news there. I do want to walk you through your weekend here. Saturday afternoon, we'll see our high temperatures climb into the mid to upper 70s. A few high thin clouds moving in, uh, but that's going to be about it. We're still going to get a lot of sunshine on Saturday. Winds out of the south, 5 to 10 miles per hour. So we will see a change in our wind direction through Saturday. But that south wind is not going to stay in place very long. We've got a dry cold front coming in on Sunday, right about midday, early afternoon. This is not going to bring us any rain, but it is going to give us another kind of reinforcing nudge of some dry air that will be moving in Sunday afternoon settling in on Monday. So winds will become north northeasterly again by Sunday afternoon and we'll pick up a little bit of a breeze to finish up the weekend. But uh, what this dry cold front will do for us is not allow our dew points to climb. They're going to try to sneak into the low 50s on Sunday morning. That's still feeling very comfortable, but before they can get too high, that dry cold front is going to put our dew points back in the 30s and 40s through early next week. And then it looks like they really will start to climb late next week into the start of next weekend, but that is still a week away. So humidity staying nice and low for trick or treating Saturday evening. Clear skies here. Temperatures will be falling out of the 70s into the 60s. Light winds couldn't ask for better weather for trick or treating. The kiddos will not be sweating in their costumes this year, so that is good news. A look at your Friday 42 in the morning, 72 in the afternoon. Don't forget about those layers. They come in handy, that's for sure. And really, we're looking at dressing in layers for the next several days. It won't be until the middle and back half of next week that that humidity starts to creep back in and we'll start to get closer to 80 degrees. So I don't know if you heard me the other day, but I said the dancing mummy reminds me of Adam Caskey for some reason. Oh yeah. In that graphic. Oh, it only does. I can't figure out who the Frankenstein it would look like. Maybe <laughs> I knew you were going there. <laughs> knew you were going there. All right. I know so you too well. High, oh school, high school football tonight, Greg. <laughs> Greg and Stein. <laughs> we'll see how it works out. Well, the big question tonight is, could Wagner stay number one in 12's top 12, taking on New Brothels? When we come back, we have the answer for you and all the highlights on a Thursday night of big game coverage and the final interview before fight night on Fright Night coming up.
We begin our big game coverage of the New Braunfels Unicorns visiting the number one ranked Wagner Thunderbirds at Rutledge Stadium tonight. 30 seconds left of the first half. The game is tied at seven all. The Unicorns looking for a little magic. Quarterback Peyton Driggers goes deep to Joseph Cholico down the sideline. Gets pushed out just before he reaches the end zone, but that's a pickup of 35 yards. A couple of plays later, Ryan Wilson caps off the drive with a two yard touchdown. The Unicorns take the lead at the time. 14 to seven. The final from Converse. Unicorns in a stunning upset. 36 to 19. The Smithson Valley Rangers hosting the South Sand Bobcats tonight. Smithson Valley now on the six-yard line. Justin Avery on the handoff goes up the middle for the first touchdown of the game, and the Rangers would score again. In fact, on the very next series, Smithson Valley first and goal. They keep it on the ground. Travis McCracken right up the middle, and it's now 14 to nothing lead. The final from Rangers Stadium, 48 to nothing. Smithson Valley over at Gustafson Stadium tonight. Clark Cougars visiting the Stevens Falcons with the Falcons coming off their first loss of the season. The Falcons defense makes a big stop. Clark inside the red zone. They go for to the air. Darius Ellis tips the pass. Mateo Lara makes the diving interception to end that drive. Falcons take over on offense. KK Brashears keeps it on the option read and then get out of his way. He's gone for the 95-yard touchdown untouched. The final from Gustafson. and the Cougars come back and win this 26-21. This is the the home field for Alamo Heights this season as they're renovating Orem Stadium for the Mules, hosting Medina Valley at Coma Lander. We're in the third quarter when quarterback James Sobey throws a perfect strike over the middle to Joe Ramirez for the touchdown that put the Mules up 23 to nothing. The final from Coma Lander is 30 to nothing, Alamo Heights. And finally, the first game of the season at Alamo Stadium where the mighty Mustangs of Jefferson High School face off against Lanier in the start of zone play. Vokes turn it up on defense. Don Trevious Wellens knocks the pass up in the air, gets bobbled around until it falls into Wellens' hands for the interception. Lanier would turn that into points. Fabian Maciel with the quarterback sneak. Lanier goes up by 12, 12 to nothing. The final from the Rock Pile, the Mustangs, and the Vokes season opener, 12 to nothing Lanier. As the Dallas Cowboys prepare Go for their Sunday Vogue showdown. Powered by Davis Lawford. Pardon me, as they prepare for their Sunday showdown in the NFC East Division rivals, the Eagles in Philadelphia, there's still a question who will start at quarterback. Andy Dalton did not practice for the second straight day as he continues to be in the NFL's concussion protocol, but has been able to participate in quarterback team meetings, which means the Cowboys are holding out hope he might be able to play Sunday night. If not, seventh-round draft pick Ben DiNucci will get his first start in the NFL after getting his first taste of pro football last week when he had to come in for Dalton in the third quarter against Washington. For me, this is a, a, an opportunity of a lifetime. I think, you know, as a rookie, a seventh rounder, I think, you know, coming in, you see Dak and you see Andy at the top of the uh, top of the depth chart. And you're like, hey, there's, there's you know, there's there's no chance that, you know, I'm going to be on the field this year. But, you know, hey, this is 2020. What else do you expect? Here we are. And uh, week eight of my rookie year, I've got a chance to go out there on Sunday night football and, and do what I love to do. So I, I couldn't be happier and more excited. The Cowboys are nine point underdogs against the Eagles Sunday night. Coming up, we visit with the fighters for the main event Saturday night in the Dome next. Top prospect of the 2022 recruiting class, quarterback Quinn Ewers of South Lake Carroll, has decommitted to Texas. The 6'3", 205 pound prospect, who was considered to be the nation's number one recruit, has changed his mind about attending Texas after committing the Longhorns in August. He made his announcement on Twitter saying he had fully explored his options in the recruiting process. It hasn't helped that the Longhorns have struggled this season with Tom Herman as a head coach, looking, losing back to back games in the Big 12 before rebounding against Baylor last week, now having to face six ranked and undefeated Oklahoma State on the road this Saturday. In the even though the game is in Stillwater, the Longhorns are only three and a half point underdogs. Quarterback Sam Ellinger was asked if this had to be a statement game. Well, I think that that's what we're constantly trying to prove. Uh, we're, we're trying to prove each other right. And, um, you know, obviously we, we're, we're continuing to improve and clean up on, on mistakes. So uh, that's what it's always been about. And it will continue to be that way. Kickoff on Saturday in Stillwater is set for 3 p.m. Today in downtown San Antonio, the fighters for the main event address the media for the final time before Saturday's Showtime pay-per-view fights. Gervonta Davis and Leo Santa Cruz will be fighting for each other's title belts. They're also excited to fight in front of fans. This will be the first boxing match in the country to allow fans to attend since COVID-19 started. For Santa Cruz, this is also a homecoming. You know, if I hear once, there's a lot of Mexican people here, uh, Latin people and everything up that support me and you know this is like my second hometown so I'm really happy to fight here and give the fans a great show. Definitely want to see what what kind of fans come out what cheer for me and what cheer for my opponent you know so um, I'm definitely uh, looking forward to it and I can't wait. 
Our producer, Daniel Villanueva, got to interview both of them today. As you can see, the final weigh-in is tomorrow at noon. You can read more about Saturday's fight, including the title defense for Mario Barrios. It's on the Instant Replay page of KSAT.com right now. And they're allowing fans up to 11,000 in the Alamo Dome. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Greg. Got it. We're going to continue our coverage of that standoff after a shooting in far west Fair County. It's in the Alamo Ranch area. Yeah, our Tiffany Huertas just wrapped up a news conference with Sheriff Javier Salazar. She joins us live with the very latest. Tiffany? Steve Easy, this is still a very active scene here at the Summit Alamo Ranch neighborhood. We just heard from Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar, who says this involved a domestic disturbance. Now, he says an argument between a man and a woman escalated. This is how it all started. He says the man allegedly shot the woman in her 30s. She was taken to the hospital and is in critical condition tonight. She is in surgery. Salazar says there were three kids in the home, but none of them were injured. Sheriff Salazar says they believe the man is still inside the home and he is asking if he is watching to peacefully surrender. Now, negotiators and SWAT team are still here at the scene and we'll bring you the very latest on KSAT.com. Back to you. Thank you, Tiffany. We're going to take your questions to one of our experts, our KSAT Q&A with infectious disease Dr. Ruth Bergeron coming up. We are still very much in the middle of a pandemic, and that's why we are pleased to be joined every Thursday by infectious disease doctor from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, Dr. Ruth Berger. And doctor, thank you as always for staying up late with us. What are you making of the numbers that we see locally when they're compared to what you see, you know, not that far away in El Paso, other parts of the state, other parts of the country? Right, so San Antonio has an opportunity. We really are in a window of opportunity to hang on to this relatively lower positivity rate. I know that it's gone up a little bit in the last couple of weeks. We're at 6.9% on the city's website. That is a reflection of all comers who go to get tested. Remember that that is going to be a self-selected population and it will fluctuate depending on where testing is available and how we're pushing testing. There's another set of numbers that are really hopeful to me and what I want us to hang on to. Um, we have been regularly testing all of the inmates when they get booked at the Bear County Jail. Uh, it's 100 to 150 people every day. They get tested whether they have symptoms or not. And the we've been looking very carefully at our data over the last eight weeks, actually. And we have seen this uh, positivity rate for those incomers go down from 5%, 3%, 2%, 1%. And so that's one measure um, of one particular population in San Antonio, but there are others. And we test everybody who's getting uh, elective surgical procedures. So if you have a non-urgent surgery, that's a scheduled procedure, you're gonna have a COVID test before you come in for that. Those people are showing one to 1 1.5% positivity as are people coming in for dental procedures oh, wow. at wow. Health. So this tells us something good and something positive. The hospitalization rate had taken a little peak um, earlier uh, this week, maybe end, end of last week, but we're hovering at just a little bit above 200. That's been fairly flat over time. So here's the deal. Uh, we can hang on to this if we modify our behaviors. If we hang on to them, we don't give up hope, don't lower the mask, don't give up on the hand washing and the distancing, redouble your efforts. Uh, to protect one another. Otherwise, we will go the way of El Paso, uh, France, and other parts of the country. We saw staggeringly high new positive rates across the country today. But remember, these things are very regional, and we can hang on to this advantage that we have in San Antonio. You know, everyone talks about the year 2021 as just this awful, difficult year, and everybody wants 2020, I'm sorry, 2020 to just be over with. But we're hearing experts talk about be prepared to for this to continue into 2021. What is the likelihood that we're going to be dealing with this still this time next year? Well, I think things will be better, but I think we're still going to be dealing with it, to be perfectly honest. Why do I say that? Um, first of all, the vaccine in the best case scenario, we're talking about 70 percent effective. We also know that it's going to take quite a bit of effort and a lot of logistics 
to get the whole country immunized. So, and that's going to happen in waves. So this time next year, I doubt we'll have had every single person in America immunized. And even if we had, that would be 70% effective. We also are still learning how long the immunity will last. So there is no question in my mind that we will still be taking precautions next year, but I am a hopeful person and I believe that we will be in a better situation. I think we'll probably have better drugs. We'll be a whole year smarter about how to manage people when they're sick. So that's hopeful. I want to combine a couple of our viewer questions into one. One question was, how is the flu season so far? And another question is how to tell whether you have the flu or COVID-19? So far, the flu season has not taken off in a big way in San Antonio. Um, really not a lot of cases. Uh, we have had a big push uh, for flu vaccination, lots of flu drives going on. That together with the fact that people are listening to the precautions that we're, we're um, teaching, preaching for COVID-19, these things are, are weighing in our favor with respect to our flu numbers, but it's only October. And as you know, the flu season often peaks much later than that and into January and February. So um, let's stay tuned about that. With respect to telling the difference, um, it's hard. So if you have the flu, you need to go and get tested for COVID and flu. Uh, and likely you'll get started on Tamiflu um, while you wait for your results to come back. But one of the biggest differentiators that I want people to be aware of is loss of sense of smell and taste that happens with COVID. It doesn't happen with the flu, or if it does, it's extremely rare. And the other thing is a runny nose. Runny nose is not a common or major presentation for COVID-19, and it really is with the flu. That having been said, nobody, um, not even an infectious disease doctor with almost 30 years of experience, <laughs> uh, can look at a person and say whether it's COVID or whether it's flu. And we talk so much about wearing the mask and social distancing and washing hands, but also taking care of one's mental health is also important. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, we you all had a, a story on just a moment ago um, that I think you know reflects the fact that this pandemic um, and all of the stress that's happening in the country right now with the economic distress and with a fraud election is taking its toll on people's mental health. I had a conference this morning with colleagues and I heard from a pediatrician and I heard from an emergency medicine doctor that were really concerned about how children are being treated, um, that when parents are stressed, they tend to parent in a kind of a snappy way, um, and that the parenting that, is, that they're able to provide isn't the best for childhood development and for learning. So there's stress in our children. And we're seeing a lot of evidence in the emergency room of depression, mental illness, um, opioid dependence, substance abuse, all of which is taking its toll. And it's a reflection of the really serious mental health outcomes. And, and it shows also we have a lack of access to just quality mental health care in our country. And this is something that we need to do better at and we need to renew our efforts to try to make um, basic health care services, including mental health care, accessible to all people. Quickly before we let you go, Halloween, just a couple of days away, then we've got Thanksgiving, then we've got Christmas. What will you tell people? I mean, these are normally, certainly Thanksgiving and Christmas, normally times where you get together with family, their family holidays. What's the best advice that you can give people? Right, celebrate your family through these holidays by protecting one another. And I really want people to think about keeping the grandparents safe. We want the grandparents here next year. We want them at the, at the table at Thanksgiving. We wanna see them at our winter holidays. We wanna see them at Hanukkah and Christmas. If we want our grandparents to be there, we need to protect them now. And that means making a few sacrifices, not hugging and kissing. It means uh, keeping the younger people who've been out um, working and socializing and maybe coming home from college, keeping them separate from the older folks. And it will seem a little sad, but there are other ways that people can make up for it. And you know, you all have heard me giving all sorts of ideas about how to do Halloween differently this year. I'd like to ask the KSAT viewers to uh, write us 
send us emails and text messages and give us your creative ideas. What are you planning to do at your Thanksgiving that's going to be different this year, but that still celebrates life, celebrates our gratitude for being alive and being together, but celebrates it in a way that keeps each other safe. That's a good idea. Great advice. Dr. Ruth Berger with UT Health San Antonio, as always, appreciate your time. Thank you. We'll be right back. It's almost here. In less than 24 hours, we here at KSAT will be presenting the 2020 Day of the Dead River Parade. Due to the pandemic, the festivities have gone virtual this year. Tonight, a look behind the scenes of this year's parade and some of the beautiful barges you'll see tomorrow night. <laughs> Filled with lights, colors, and art. The barges of the 2020 Day of the Dead River Parade were created in Mexico at the skilled hands of Mexican artists and designers. Estos son los pisos de la barca de las calaveras de azúcar. Y bueno, aquí tenemos todo esta parte del de alebrije, bueno, la barca de los alebrijes. The parade preparations began months ago. From the muñecas to the calaveras, each piece was carefully crafted, then hand-painted, before being brought to the U.S. The attention to detail making these displays an impressive sight to behold. Tiene 50 centímetros de altura por unos 50 de largo. Once the barges arrived in San Antonio, then began the task of holding a parade in the shadows of the night. No crowds allowed, lots of social distancing, and of course, face masks for those helping to bring the parade to life. A beautiful display of culture and tradition as San Antonio celebrates Day of the Dead. Isis Romero, KSAT 12 News. And there is only one place to see the 2020 Day of the Dead River Parade. Join us tomorrow for our special presentation. The parade is virtual this year, so tune in to see all of the action from 8 until 10 p.m. tomorrow night. We cannot wait to share it with you. I know. I'm, I'm very so excited. excited. Turning now to our weather, 54 degrees out there, Katie. Yes, nice and cool out there this evening. I'm so excited for tomorrow. I know you guys have put so much work into this, including a lot of um, our folks here at KSAT. It is going to be awesome tomorrow evening, and I think if you can set it up to maybe uh, stream the parade, sit outside, at least open the windows, it's going to be so nice tomorrow evening. Great, uh, great weather to enjoy the parade. Just take the TV outside and pretend you're at the Arneson. <laughs> We're not all Tim Gerber. He has his, like his projector oh, thing yeah, set up yeah. in the backyard. like a whole different level. I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> if you've got that, go for it. But yeah, <laughs> find a find a cool spot tomorrow evening to enjoy the parade. It'll be really nice. We've got great weather coming up, not just tomorrow, but also the next several days. Check out your high temperatures this afternoon. Our average high in San Antonio is 78. We were a solid 10 degrees cooler than that this afternoon with that sunshine. Just a great day. We're going to warm up a bit as we head into the weekend. Our mornings will still be quite cool with temperatures in the 40s, low 50s by Sunday, and then afternoon high temperatures mid to upper 70s, but overall really nice stretch of some fall like weather coming your way, including on Halloween. Temperatures across Texas now mid 50s here in San Antonio. We've got some 40s up through Central Texas, 30s there in the Panhandle, the coolest air of course as well to our north this evening, but we'll still see our temperatures bottom out in the low 40s by tomorrow morning. So if you were with us yesterday, we were talking about Hurricane Zeta that made landfall yesterday after afternoon down in South Louisiana, uh, just south of New Orleans. The remnants of that hurricane, the leftover moisture is, is all of this moisture that's up here in the far northeastern U.S. moving into the Atlantic. So that system essentially is gone. There is some leftover moisture, but uh, Zeta moved through the southeastern U.S. last night and very early this morning. All of these storm reports associated with Zeta over the last 24, 36 hours or so, and they extend all the way from the Gulf Coast, Louisiana and Mississippi into a portion of North Carolina and Virginia. So the effects of Zeta uh, were wide, wide ranging uh, across the U.S. yesterday. You would think that things would start to quiet down in the tropics here, but 
hurricane season does run until the end of November, so something to keep in mind. And there is a disturbance moving into the Caribbean tonight that the National Hurricane Center gives a 70% chance of becoming at least our next tropical depression, potentially our next name storm. If it does become at least a tropical storm, it would take the name Ada here in the Greek alphabet. That would be the first time that we've gotten this far in the Greek alphabet. Back in 2005, that was a very active season, but we only got as far as Zeta. We've already used Zeta, so we'll have to watch that disturbance in the Caribbean to see what happens right now. Not an immediate threat to the U.S. coastline. Here at home, we've got a nice fall like weekend coming up. You may be curious about Halloween trick or treating. However, you're going to celebrate whether it's at home or uh, heading out safely. I love this graphic. I can't take credit for the graphic design here, uh, but I think this is a cool graphic. Some of you may be celebrating Halloween this way this year. Saturday evening, we'll see clear skies, low humidity, temperatures falling through the 60s overall. Just really, really pleasant. Pleasant tomorrow as well. Very similar to today, temperature wise, 40s in the morning, 70s in the afternoons, and it won't be quite as gusty tomorrow. Winds will be light out of the east, just 5 to 10 miles per hour. We do fall back officially at 2 a.m. Sunday morning, an extra hour of sleep, but our sunrise and sunsets will be about an hour earlier beginning on Sunday, so that's something I know folks have to get used to. And we'll enjoy nice fall-like weather through Election Day on Tuesday. Yeah, I like the star you've got on Election Day there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Katie. Mm -hmm. You still had Netflix making plans on pricing amid the pandemic, what it means for your bill coming up on the night beat. And we check in on the race for president, both campaigns focusing on Florida, and its voters, but what other states are the candidates watching? It's coming up next on the Night Beat. There are more than 81 million Americans and counting that have voted early, according to the U.S. Elections Project. That's nearly 60 percent of the total 2016 turnout. A number of these states are tightly contested, including Florida, where both campaigns held dueling rallies today. ABC's Alex Prochet has more from Washington. President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden today focused on Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, the heart and soul of this country is at stake right here in Florida. It's up to you. Biden leads the president in most national polls, but the 538 poll average has them separated by just two points in the Sunshine State. Both candidates courting voters today in this critical battleground. New GDP numbers giving the president something to brag about. They say talk about your economic success. Talk about 33.1%, the greatest in history. Now, look, if I do, I mean, how many times can I say it? Third quarter GDP grew by more than 33 percent, a record number after massive losses tied to COVID-19. But economists caution without new COVID-19 economic stimulus and aggressive efforts to reduce the spread of the virus, that growth could shrink. And the country is still dealing with a pandemic. More than 88,000 new COVID cases in one day, also a record number, as Americans filed 751,000 unemployment claims just last week. Both parts of Joe Biden's closing argument. Millions of people out there are out of work, on the edge, can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, and Donald Trump has given up. The senior vote, a critical voting block in the country, but especially Florida. Since his records show, over 70% of seniors voted in the last election, more than any other age group. And the villages in Florida is home to the largest retirement community in the country. It's a group the president has had support from in the past. Another crucial demographic, the Latino vote. Polls vary by double digits, with a new Marist NBC poll showing Trump up by six points among Florida Latino voters, while the latest Monmouth poll has Biden leading by 26 points among the same group in the Sunshine State. And while Florida will be critical, many once reliably red states are now too close to call. Texas, Arizona, even Georgia. More than 81 million Americans have already voted early, either in person or by mail, according to the U.S. Elections Project, just five days before Election Day. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. Well, many have passed the time binge watching Netflix during the pandemic. Today, the company announced it's raising prices on its standard and premium plans. The company's standard plan is now $14, up $1 from last year. A premium subscription will go up $2 to $18 a month. The basic plan remains unchanged at $9 a month. Netflix's stock actually rose 5%.
following the news. Two restaurant chains set to close down several of its businesses because of a financial hit amid the pandemic. Applebee's and IHOP will be impacted. Wednesday Dine Brands, the parent company for the two chains, announced it is shutting down up to 100 restaurants. Approximately 15 Applebee's locations could close their doors, with IHOP locations potentially feeling most of the impact. No word on which locations would be closed, but it's expected to happen in the next six months. The CBS has announced plans to expand its COVID-19 testing services. The pharmacy wants to add rapid result testing at nearly 1,000 locations by the end of the year. Nearly 100 of these rapid result test sites will be operational this week. The tests are available at no cost to patients who meet CDC criteria. You must register in advance at CVS.com to schedule an appointment. We have no idea at this point whether any of these locations are in San Antonio. The pandemic has had some rethinking haunted houses. The display that has drivers pulling up to one home coming up. At Water, California residents got a new neighbor, Michael Myers. Oh, the homeowner built the display outside their own home, which plays scenes from the 1978 horror film Halloween. The couple says it was going to be a walkthrough experience, but because of COVID-19, they decided to put together a drive-by show instead. Dozens show up each night to watch the projections. Bombs away or... Reese's peanut butter cups away. One Pennsylvania family has safe candy distribution down to his science this Halloween. The Mac family created a candy catapult to launch goodies to trick or treaters. Ingenuity right there. Yeah. Good night.